uh, everything. Oh, we're live. All now. right, welcome to Nerd Stalker. I am Adolfo Ferrand uh, at Nerd Stalker on Twitter, and uh, you hey. are Greg Voria, aka Social Greg, on Twitter for the Nerd Stalker Media Network. How you doing, pal? Great. Another good show. Yeah. Live yeah. here. Uh, we're done. See you later. Good night, everyone. Yeah, we'll see. You. We'll see you later. <laughs> yeah. Quick show tonight. <laughs> we Adolfo just wanted to see himself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Greg is just back from the future of money. Yes. Back from the feature of money, and that was really good. That was really good. Thank you, Brian Zisk, out there, if you could hear this. Uh, great show uh, at the Hotel Kabugi, Japan Town. And uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. That's all I could say. Well, really? I'll do, wow. I'll do, uh, I'll do a uh, recap of that a little later uh, awesome. on a separate note. A little more uh, we shot a lot of good cool. footage. Yeah, we sh- shot a lot of good footage with Liberty Madison, that tech girl. So. Yeah, Liberty. Yeah. Go get it. So let's let's open with the first story. Uh, Yahoo tells the SEC thirty-one uh, percent comes out uh, of our revenue comes from Microsoft. Really? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, I'm gonna make sure we are doing the switcherooski. Yeah. Okay. So Yahoo, ya- Yahoo. So everyone, some people call it Yahoo. And you Yahoo. Call it Yahoo. So yeah. yeah. Yahoo tells the SEC 31% of our revenue comes from Microsoft. Uh, Yahoo has revealed in a SEC commission filing that nearly one-third of its revenue last quarter, 31%, came from its search deal with Microsoft, according to a Bloomberg report. That's far higher far higher than the more than 10% figure Yahoo previously acknowledged, making it seem even more difficult for the company to potentially walk away from the deal. Um, so... We, yeah, so in response to Yahoo's last quarterly 10Q filing posted November 11th and also highlighted Silicon Beat at further details, um, they bolded the key parts uh, that for the last quarter, 31% of Yahoo's total revenue came from Microsoft. Originally, their headline said 31% of search revenue, but seeing the filings made it clear that this is for all Yahoo revenue. That's up from 27% from the same quarter in the previous year. Uh, the filing's been out for nearly a month, and it's been news. It's a disappointing deal. You know, in 2009, the deal with Yahoo and Microsoft has never produced much revenue as originally promised. Microsoft was on the hook to cover any shortfalls for the first 18 months of the deal. It has extended those guarantees twice now, carrying through until March 31, 2014. The articles below uh, have more background on this, um, on the article. The new Yahoo figures uh, that it's much further away from the long-standing revenue goals and previously thought, making a potential walk away from Microsoft very difficult. Whoa. The company now lacks up-to-date uh, search technology to c- compete with either Microsoft, Bing, Search Engine, or Google if it oh. goes alone, and it would take a harder revenue hit in doing so, assuming Microsoft doesn't agree to extend the revenue guarantees for a third time. Of course, Yahoo could be in a position to uh, get a better deal from Microsoft just by threatening to go to Google. Uh, Yahoo can do this without question as of February 23rd, 2015. It potentially could do so when the next revenue guarantees expire, depending on the exact wording of that agreement and how it relates back to the original agreement. Um, this assumes that Yahoo would be allowed to partner with Google. It was denied that opportunity back in 2008 on antitrust grounds when it wanted to, and uh, now that Law- Yahoo has less market share, maybe this would be allowed, and Google certainly open to it, apparently. Uh, Yahoo's already oh. tried to get out of the agreement in Taiwan and Hong Kong and lost legally in October, Publicly, Yahoo still talks optimistically about search, uh, as it did in October, but in reality, Yahoo continues to... This is really weird. Yahoo continues to lose share to Bing, the search engine that Microsoft owns. It's losing... So let's, you know, let's, let's ponder this for a minute. It's losing to its partner, even as it remains beholden to that partner, and there's no clear plan on how that's going to be reversed. So a super weird situation for for Yahoo, uh, compounded by the fact that I'm amazed that Google would be open to it. I guess they don't care because money is money. But uh, Marissa Mayer used to Meyer, however you want to pronounce it, used to work at Google, right? And yeah. she effectively got sort of pushed out in a way, or you know, the ceiling came down. And it wasn't. It was apparent that she wasn't in the inner circle. Became CEO of Yahoo, and um, buddy buddy with Microsoft, and and now here we are. But the sheer number alone, 31% of total yeah, revenue crazy. for Yahoo. That's great. And then, you know, there's been some talk, of Greg, that we've talked before on this show that Microsoft shareholders are putting the pressure on Microsoft to get rid of Bing altogether because it's such a money hemorrhaging project. Well, I, you know, I, I think there, there's the pressure on the Microsoft side, right? And then there's pressure on the Yahoo side. Now, in, you know, in Japan, um, Yahoo 
search in Japan is actually quite good, and mm -hmm. it's, it's one of it's in the top. If I think Google finally surpassed it, but it it is in the top two at least, top mm -hmm. three. And yeah. um, so you know, Yahoo search does does work in some areas a little bit better than others. But yeah, that's a you know I think she, it's just part of the whole deal she inherited when she came on board. You know, I, I think this yeah. isn't going to be an easy uh, surgery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, so I a lot, a lot more Yahoo news to come. So yeah. great next story though. Meet the pitcher. What's up? Yeah, let's uh, let's talk about that. I was uh, really glad to. Um, to uh, interview this week uh, for SF New Tech, a, a new smartwatch that came on the market, which uh, I'll show you just in a little bit. I'll share that screen with you. You guys see that? Yes, you see it now. So um, it's called the Hot Smartwatch, and they'll be pitching at the SF New Tech event coming up this Wednesday, which is tomorrow. Um, one thing I thought was really cool about this technology is that it, it allows you to use the cup of your hand to talk. So basically there's a uh, speaker that comes out of the wristband, reflects off your hand and into your ear. So you could put up, uh, you basically could put up your um, uh, your hand to your ear just like you're talking on the cell phone but have a private conversation that's Bluetooth connected. So to your... Hang on, hang on Greg, something glitched here. We lost, we lost you for the, what looks, appears to be the whole part of your story. Oh really? We are back on air. Yeah, we're back live again, but everything went dark for a minute there. Whoa! Uh, you know you're frozen uh, right now. I am. Well, on my screen you are. Uh, ah, yeah. So I see your screen. So yeah, if you could take it from the top of that story, sure, that'd be awesome. Sure. Anyway, um, a hot smartwatch is a, a watch that uh, I interviewed for SF New Tech this week, and they'll be pitching tomorrow at. Uh, uh, the mighty 119 Utah Street, uh, SF New Tech. But it's called a hot smartwatch. And uh, one thing that's really unique about this is if you look at this circle down here, this this hand, on, it allows you to talk mm -hmm. with the palm of your hand in a private conversation. So think about this. The actual speaker is coming out of your wristband in reflecting off of your hand into your ear. So you could actually have a private conversation in the oh, most right, noisiest right, right. places. Um, and uh, at least that's the promise. It's, it's a Kickstarter project. Uh, or actually, they just finished their Kickstarter. I apologize. They just finished the Kickstarter and hit about um, five times their original goal. So they hit their stretch goal of 600K. So it's, it's really popular. And uh, last week, I told you guys that I was on at a um, kind of a connectivity um, kind of a where you know, Wear Tech uh, event last week, and uh, Pebble was there. So he was taught the the founder of Pebble was talking Very about cool. you know their their uh, their smartwatch entrance. So you know these things are just coming, but uh, I think the main thing to think about here is connectivity. I think that's really what I want. What really killed the other watches? They tried to be another device, right? Mm. They tried mm -hmm. to be another device that was just another device you had to manage, right? So now these are connected devices, which makes a lot more sense to me, right? Um, so. Um, it's yeah, it's pretty cool. So I think uh, you know, keep an eye on these guys. Um, I think they're onto something, and they have some uh, IP and patenting here that could uh, could make it interesting play for a bigger company like uh, Nike or someone else to buy them or something like that. So nice, uh, man. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I'm really I, I like the advent of all this these wearable things that extend you know functionality and stuff too. That's right. that's a really right. really nice thing. Right. All right. Well, let's move <clears> to the next one. Another Yahoo story. <laughs> Yahoo acquires yeah. Quick IO, yet another startup to add to its video team. Yeah, Yahoo seems to be on this sort of acquisition terror, you know. And yeah. this one, thank you to Pando.com for this story. Um, early this morning, the creators of a little-known but excellent cross-platform video streaming app called Quick IO sent a farewell note to its users. After December 31, the FedEx of media files, that's what they've been known as, would be shut down, the email said. Um, when they sent an email to the CEO asking uh, Michael Chen, uh, asking him what happened, uh, the query was directed to Yahoo PR rep, and uh, they learned of another Yahoo media acquisition. Uh, they can confirm that the you know the it, it seems like an acquire really, and yeah. what do you call those uh, acquisition to hire the talent kind of thing, right? Yeah, right? And that they've joined basically the video part of the team. Um, talent acquisition. So both the CEO and VoIP expert who left a manager role at Cisco to start the company and Quick.io co-founder VP of Engineering uh, Zhu Min Wu, uh, another Cisco alum, have updated their LinkedIn profiles to reflect the place of the new employment. Um, so uh, personally, uh, 
you know, I was sad, and the writer too is sad to see the end of Quick IO. Uh, he found it useful for playing videos on on his iPad and stored mm. uh, on the laptop that were stored on his laptop. And it shut down email. Quick IO team recommends using Plex, Tonito, Air Video, and uh, Air Play It as alternatives. I haven't tried any of those except Plex in the early days, mm. um, so I, I can't really comment on those quite yet. Mm. I'm going to have to evaluate them. <laughs> oh, man. But the acquisition ticks a few different boxes for the Sunnyvale company, most notably in mobile and video. Quick IO joins a host of other startups in those categories that have been acquired under Marissa Mayer's leadership, including Int, Event Live, Pitch, Quickie, and On the Air. Quick IO has raised $1.28 million in venture funding from Singapore-based wow. Inspire Capital, and so continues the trend of Yahoo exit in a Series A crunch. So it's a bummer. As I, as I said earlier, you know, um, I personally, I think last year I named uh, Quick IO as my app, one of the apps of my favorite yeah, apps of the year, and a beer thing, and like they were, it was that good. I used it, and it was free. It was great, mm -hmm. as effectively, as like a cloud at your home, like a, on my mm -hmm. mini at home, my server uh, at home. I have all my music files, my photos, and uh, videos, movies, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, man. And I could, uh, you know, just with the free Quick IO app on the phone, access all that stuff. Oh no! Uh, just just from quick I, having quick I/O on both of those guys, uh, over you know Wi-Fi or cell network if I so if so choose, and it was ridiculous fast, and you could transfer files super fast too. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow! Wow! So it's it's a huge loss. It's it's a bummer. But um, yeah. Yahoo, you know, good on Yahoo for getting fantastic talent because man, those guys really made something uh, pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, I guess they're gonna create Yahoo Video. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay, we're back. Sorry, folks, we had a little um, what appears to be technical Google Hangout difficulty, but uh, Greg has some Ubuntu to talk about here. Well, Greg, we always talked about Ubuntu, right, over the last couple of years for this podcast, right? I think uh, it's interesting is that uh, it's finally the Touch OS wins its first a parent smartphone partner. So thanks to Steven Strickland of uh, CNET for bringing that story for us. Uh, huh. So Canonical uh, has just signed its first deal to supply a smartphone with its mobile operating system. And uh, the founder and product strategy leader, uh, Mark Shulworth, uh, revealed that in an interview at the Le Web Conference, uh, he wouldn't say which company had agreed to use uh, Linux-based OS, but it said it offered uh, be offered on a high-end phone in uh, on high-end phones on 2014. So, uh, it, that that's just amazing news. I I mean, uh, which could be an interesting win, right? Yeah, um, you, you've talked about it. it for a while, right? I mean, Linux, right? So yeah, it's great. Um, you know, some of the people who've always been kind of um, you know, so Shulworth uh, says that, you know, that he, he's got a big uh, hill to climb still, you know, with the mobile OS players like the Windows Phone from Microsoft, mm -hmm. ties in from uh, Samsung and Intel, mm -hmm. and Firefox OS from Mozilla, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, uh, you know, he's, I think they just need to take that first step. So, you know, I, I think whatever the people are going to like or dislike from this first step is going to be really their their future, right? So mm -hmm. um, I, I hope they do well because there's a lot of people um, like uh, um, Verizon, Deutsche Telekom, uh, T-Mobile, um, SK Telecom, who's expressed some interest in, in this operating system, right? So mm -hmm. Yeah, that's neat. You know, so I think this is really cool. So I, I it just broke today, and so... Uh, um, I think uh, you know. Stay tuned, folks, for for Ubuntu coming online next year sometime. So awesome! It's really Ready to go cool. open source. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's go to the next one. Microsoft. <laughs> this is a Microsoft Yahoo uh, story uh, day for you. Microsoft yeah. finally brings back full start menu with Windows 8.2. Oh my God, this is yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. So thanks, Brad Reed, for uh, Boyd Junior support for. Uh, this story, as as they noted last week, Windows 8 is a very polarizing operating system, right? Uh, while many Windows users find it much faster and more stable than earlier versions of Windows, other, user, other users simply hate the Metro UI, and that's what I've experienced too, is everyone that I talk to is not pleased with it, and yeah. they wish it would go away. Uh, Paul Farrat reports some good news for desktop users who feel spurned by Windows 8 and aren't satisfied with the changes made with Windows 8.1. Microsoft is working hard to appease them. The most important change, as Therat hears it, is that Microsoft will finally be bringing back the full start menu to the Windows 8.2 desktop mode. 
Unlike the current start menu that Microsoft added to Windows 8.1, the new start menu will be much more like the one Windows users have known and loved since Windows 95. Wow, Therat also says look, that the yeah. new version of Windows will allow for Metro apps to run as floating windows on the desktop screen, something, something that users can only do right now if they've installed third-party applications such as Modern Mix. Therat says that while these changes alone may not be enough oh to God. make hardcore desktop fans happy, it's still a good sign that Microsoft is continuing to do the right thing and responding to complaints. Uh, I don't know about you, Greg, but this sounds to me like a lot of backtracking and... Oh, um, and a stab in the heart of the uh, Metro design team, you know, yeah. and, and the Windows 8 design team who attempted to make something revolutionary and very different. And well, who's driving the boat? I, I, that's what I want to know at Microsoft because usually, I mean, Microsoft, uh, God. They're well, you know, I, I'm wondering what's, what's up. But, you know, I think what I heard before, and Therod has mentioned this before too, is that, you know, you usually do this type of user research with users, right? A big collection of people. And in the past, Microsoft had seeded early versions of this kind of stuff to mm. a bunch of users or a lot of people. And apparently in the the creation of Metro or whatever, it was a very small subset in the usual public testers were not um, asked to do a lot of testing. Now, I, I'm sort of paraphrasing here, but the, you know that that could have that could have affected them. You know, thinking they had a beautiful de design, which they do, but if it doesn't resonate with people, which it apparently isn't, um, it, it's not going to work. You know what I mean? Well, not everyone I, can drive a Ferrari. Hmm? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I think you know. I, they need to really seriously think about this. Either either a, a a a back selection menu where you could actually select either one, or something like that. I mean, to go completely back to that, you know, I, on the I, you know what I added to your tweet when you tweeted that out today. I said WTF <laughs> because yeah, yeah. it's just like come on, you know, it's yeah. kind of like you know, like you said, I like that 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 Ferrari thing. I mean. <sighs> I, yeah, I mean, gosh, it, it's bizarre. Even when you have like Windows hardcore Windows users, you know, complaining about it or saying, you know what, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna stay with Windows Seven. And I, I met someone today who's a hardcore yeah. Um, yeah. Windows fan, and he's the same thing. He's like, I'm, I'm using Windows Seven. I'm just staying yeah. on this. So, Greg, uh, Pirate Bay, what is oh, this? Oh yeah, news? let's this is, talk this about this. Very interesting. Well, no, yeah, the, well, uh, thank you to uh, Luke uh, Plunkett of uh, Kotaku. Uh, it's, it's, it's another blog that I read a lot. Uh, they have some interesting things. They're, they're a gaming blog. But uh, anyway, the Pirate Bay domain flees to a volcanic island. Well, why? So Torrent Trackers, the Pirate Bay, has had the authorities tighten the noose on their neck for years now, right? And uh, uh, by But this week, they have taken a twist for the absurd and... Somewhat the awesome, if you depending on want to look at it. So last night, the group's existing domain, the Pirate Bay SX, operating out of the tiny Caribbean hamlet of Saint Martin, mm -hmm. it was seized by authorities. Okay, so Torn Freak speculates that the Dutch were behind it, and that both because a Dutch group has been recently spearheading efforts against the Pirate Bay. Um, but also since uh, San Martin uh, is a remnant of Holland's colonial adventures. Mm -hmm. So now that this brought the famous site down, the Pirate Bay lives on at the new domain, working out of the volcanic rock known as the Ascension Island, a tiny British possession in the middle of the South Atlantic. <laughs> so this Dang. is pretty funny. I was uh, kind of thinking about Bond, you know, James Bond stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, while there's a certain romantic charm to the uh, picturing of a bunch of Swedish nerds holed up on a volcanic <laughs> island, <laughs> holding out against parla military copyright enforcers, reality is sadly a little more mundane. It's just uh, the domain name, and that's based on Ascension Island, not the site operation. So anyway, I, I thought that was that just hit me as interesting because uh, you know Pirate Bay's always been in the news, right? Always been kind of targeted with a lot of stuff, and the gamers just love that, right? Because that's where they pick up the yeah. games, right? Well, so. there's a lot of great stuff there, too. I mean, there's yeah. like, uh, you know, there's open source stuff there. There's free, you know, uh, stuff yeah. that is uh, Creative Commons there as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of legitimate use, too. Yeah, like, you're right. You're right. It. I mean, yeah, it isn't just gamers picking up free games so there. Shame on the stuff, Dutch yeah. government or whoever the, for going after yeah, this. Yeah, that was kind of weird, but I, I thought that was something worth mentioning in the show today because it caught, it caught my eye. So, anyway, you know what else is worth mentioning? Speed round, speed round. 
Still Greg. Okay. Meet Kubo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, thanks to uh, Colleen Taylor of TechCrunch. You know, I do read TechCrunch once in a while. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, the crowdfunded electric cargo scooter made by Lit Motor. So, I'm into... Uh, uh, Kickstarters this week. So, um, yeah, uh, Lit Motors. Kickstarter, aren't you? Look yeah, I'm a kicker. Um, the <laughs> the electric car startup that launched last year with its first vehicle called C1 has debut debuted debuted, uh, debuted. Uh, debuted. Sorry, another sl slick looking electric fuel uh, vehicle called Kubo. Uh, the Kubo is a uniquely designed vehicle that brings together the best of both worlds from scooters and cars. It's really kind of interesting. Wow, it's a yeah. two-wheeled form factor that has a nice amount of like storage space. So I, you know, I could see like the pizza delivery dudes or who, I'm, who you know, the guys who are delivering things on scooters and motorcycles right now. Yeah, uh -huh. they'll, they'll love this thing, man. Yeah. It's all electric and it, you know, it has this little big hole in the middle of it. But it's you know, like you could put a suitcase, you could put a lot of stuff in there. So it's really kind of cool, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, you know they're hoping to uh, crowdfund the initial production of Kubo through Kickstarter, as I said earlier, and um, they have a little bit over forty-five thousand has been uh -huh. pledged the three hundred thousand dollar goal so far. So with nine Great. days left, so get on there and give them money, people. <laughs> yeah, Christmas time, give them the money, man. <laughs> I think they have a long way to go, but yeah, it's kind of neat to look at that. Look at it, but um, you know, five thousand dollars will get you a reserve on one of those vehicles, man. So uh, check it out here. Uh, we'll have the we'll have the links on um, on the on Nerd Soccer, but uh, I thought it was kind of cool. Yeah, speed round, speed round. Hmm. All right, the nine best selling smartphones in Japan are all iPhones. So thanks to Boy Junior and Poor Zach Epstein for this one. Apple's iPhone five S is by all accounts the best selling smartphone on the planet by a pretty wide margin. On the other hand, the iPhone 5C has apparently been a mixed bag for Apple. While the phone seems to be fairly popular in some regions, one market research firm believes that the phone is exactly what Apple needed. Production orders were reportedly slashed pretty early on as demand wasn't quite where Apple thought it would be. In Japan, however, demand is apparently very strong. Various versions of Apple's iPhones comprise all nine of the nine best-selling smartphones in the country. Uh, as noted by Forbes, Japanese cell phone sales tracker, BCN paints a pretty clear picture of how Apple's iPhone lineup is faring in Japan, and it's faring quite well. Among the 20 best-selling smartphones in Japan for the week ending in December 1st, Apple's flagship iPhone 5S with varying amounts of storage and on various carriers occupies the following sales slots, number 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, 12, and 14. The iPhone C with varying storage sizes sits at number 4, 8, and 20. One of the 10 best-selling smartphones in Japan. Number Numbers 1 through 9 are all iPhones. Yeah, Apple has clearly, clearly advanced its position in Japan by adding NTT Docomo as a partner, and now it will look to do the same in China by launching its iPhone 5S and iPhone 5C with China Mobile. So uh, I don't know about you, Greg, but I'm very bullish on Apple in China. Oh, absolutely. I Speed died. round. Speed round, speed round. Now, so let's let's go to a, a screen share here, real quick. You guys see it? Yeah. Yep. So um, I was lucky to uh, interview uh, Zaki's this last uh, this last weekend. So uh, it's a turn signal club. It, it's really kind of cool, actually. Yeah, it's very it, cool. You know. So I, I'll play the video real quick for you guys, but it's it's uh, very obvious. It's a it's a uh, uh, bicycle glove, and it just gives you a lot of visibility. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, really cool. Yeah, we can't hear it, Greg, so you can talk over this video. Yeah, so anyway, I think uh, you could actually see what's going on there, but I, I just wanted to bring that up. They're on Kickstarter now. They just launched Monday, which was the 9th of, uh, of um, December here, and uh, they already have about $14,000. Uh, let us see, $14,959, they said, with 28 days ago, and... Uh, yeah, they're yeah, kicking they butt, a, it looks like. Huh? Goal, the goal of 35,000, so 217 backers. They're getting a lot of press. So, hmm. Yeah, um, very hot. You know, I talked to their uh, designer, and he was just having fun with it. So they're both bikers, and with the deaths rising here in San Francisco, it's a good thing. Okay, speed round, speed round. Speed round. Move it down. Yeah, man, so uh, let's uh, join... What is it? Join Santa and his elves in the countdown to Christmas Eve with uh, Google. Yeah, so to join in the flurry of preparations for Christmas Eve, visit the village every day through December 24th by going to the Google Santa Tracker. 
uh, you'll have the chance to join the elves as they catapult presents with race with reindeer, and you'll also be able to send holiday wishes to friends and family from Santa himself. Nice. The elves were made uh, make a little more progress each day, so be sure to stop by the village to see the latest. Meanwhile, a team at Google Engineers are working hard to track Santa's sleigh with the most advanced maps and holiday tech available on December 24th. Grab some cookies and cider, settle down in front of your computer, phone, or TV to watch the big guy across the globe on their Santa tracker. See where Santa's going to number um, the number of presents he's delivered and what he's thinking throughout the evening. Keep uh, up the holiday cheer across all your screens. Once the elves approve, they'll launch the Google Santa Tracker app for Android in mid-December. Use your phone for the on-the-go flight practice with the elves or cozy up near the uh, fireplace with your tablet. <laughs> nice. Follow Santa around the world as he delivers uh, presents Christmas Eve. Uh, if you have any, if you have a Chromecast. Uh, cast from the Santa Tracker Android app to explore the village or track his route yeah, right from so your TV. Cool. Or worried about you'll forget the big day, download the Chrome extension to count down Santa's nice. takeoff while browsing the web for a holiday gift. So really, really cute. All this uh, cool information at, uh, you know, you can Google the Santa, uh, Google Santa Tracker and you'll, you'll find it. Really cool stuff. Forget about the Yule log this year. Just go do the Santa tracker, right? Yeah, no way. Do both. Multi-screen. <laughs> That's right. We live in a two-screen world, right? Right. Think big. Anyway, all right. Let's uh, get in line. Tip time. Line. Tip time. Tip time. Uh, thanks to uh, let's see uh, Wits and Gordon of Lifehacker for this. I love Lifehacker. It's really cool stuff on there. So. Um, Two-factor authentication. You should get it right now. So uh, they have a great list on uh, Lifehacker um, of uh, two-factor uh, uh, yeah. authentication. Authentication. God, yeah. you know what? What they? they yeah. what, Greg's what, a drinker. What? Let's just let's put it right out there. <laughs> what? I just have? What I sign and then you speak for me. Water drinker. By the way. Okay, I'm sorry. But anyway, what's what's two-factor authentication? Um, it's basically a a simple feature that asks for more than just your password, right? So it requires something you know and something you have. So something you know could be a password. Something you have is like your phone or something else. So a code could be sent to your phone. You know, uh, I, I think uh, Facebook does that all the time. Uh, Twitter does that now with new accounts. So uh, there's a good list there. Gmail has it. Um, Apple does it. Facebook, Twitter, Dropbox does it. Uh, Evernote, PayPal, uh, all the Microsoft accounts do it. Uh, AWS does it. Uh, Yahoo Mail, LinkedIn, WordPress, and uh, a, a list of others there. So yeah, check it out. Right. That's a good tip, I think, for you guys to make sure that you are you are uh, surfing safely on the cloud. Gemin. So, all right, man. So what do we have coming up here? Actually, my tip. So my tip is oh, your the Shim tip. Browser Testing Tool. The Shim Browser Testing Tool. Shim. Uh, this is on Git. Shim is a Node.js uh, based browser compatibility tool that lets you synchronize several devices and browsers and surf the same pages simultaneously on all of them. It's really cool. So uh, Shim is a Node app uh, that enables you know simultaneous synced web surfing across a variety of devices and browsers. Shim was developed by the Boston Globe Media Lab um, who are an amazing group of developers, by the way, as a time-saving way to see how its websites render in a variety of gadgets and browser. It works by tweaking Wi-Fi to enable the easy synchronization of browsing, browsing sessions across several devices with no client configuration needed. That is neat. Uh, this makes cross-browser and cross-device testing much easier. With one click, it's possible to see a page rendered on devices of varying screen sizes, input technology, etc. Imagine a group of people browsing using a variety of devices, all connected to a single Wi-Fi access point that's running Shim. Where whenever you uh, one of them clicks on a link, all the others will be automatically redirected to the linked page. There's no device-specific configuration required, so even simple gadgets can synchronize. Uh, they've tested this so far with the iPad, iPhone, Nexus S, and Galaxy Tab, blah, 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 blah. You can go on and on in a variety of desktop browsers. But it should work on most uh, current devices, uh, anything that has a JavaScript-enabled web browser. That's huge. Uh, they've Absolutely. achieved uh, this by by turning on internet sharing on a stock MacBook Pro, then modifying it as the uh, at the system level to act as a transparent proxy. The laptop intercepts all Wi-Fi traffic and redirects it to a custom Node.js server, which inserts a JavaScript shim at the head of each web page that is visited. The shim once loaded 
in a device's browser opens and maintains a socket connection on the server. Therefore, whenever a page, a new page is requested, the page's URL is broadcast to all the connected browsers, which then redirect themselves to that URL, keeping all mm. devices perfectly in sync. Interesting. Um, yes. So, so the, the shim is amazing. This thing for any of you web developers out there, there's been something similar to this on um, that Adobe has sort of put out, but it's it's you know, only works on certain devices. It's sort of um, uh, kind of a bear to set up. This thing, basically anything with a web browser, as they say, that supports um, JavaScript, it's gonna it's gonna work for you, and then you can get a view of every everything on every kind of size device. Um, that you're trying to develop for real time. Amazing. Pretty amazing that this stuff's coming out. So um, we'll provide the link. This is on GitHub. And uh, yeah, kick ass. Wow, that's nice. God, All right. that, that is really good. I, Events I, coming up now, Greg. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know I, I skipped my turn. I, I, I can't talk it's and I skip Greg. my turn. It's, it's all, all about, about yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's all, all about, about me. It's so, about new me. tech, what's happening, man? So, anyway, we got the event tomorrow, 12 11. Uh, which is SF New Tech, uh, and right. you have you'll have the hot smartwatch there. You'll have uh, uh, you'll have a you'll have a, um, a I guess an Amazon Locker like uh, service there tomorrow. Oh, cool. night. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I in fact they have one in Japan down. I didn't realize that. I gotta go take a picture of that before I go to the SF New Tech event tomorrow. Just oh, wow. to, just to put it on my phone and tweet it out. Ribbon, so, swap box, go fetch it. Yeah, go fetch it is an coding interesting one. And yeah, more. Co coding is an interesting one. I, I we interviewed them for Meet the Pitcher, and and uh, they're a community of uh, coders that basically uh, share ideas and uh, for a very low price. Uh, you could do it for about five bucks free or you know whatever, and and, and they're just collaborative that community. So you should check them out at the. Uh, at the event to, uh, tomorrow at, at um, uh, Mighty Nightclub, uh, 119 Utah Street, San Francisco, California. Um, and then uh, the next week, uh, if you could go to the uh, uh, Christmas thing, uh, they, they have a uh, kind of a Christmas, every every year uh, SF New Tech puts a Christmas fundraiser out there. Um, you know, they we do everything from uh, uh, feed some uh, Kids uh, in Africa to um, you know help a lot of the needy, so um, awesome. we'd like to see you out there on 1218s at May's Oyster House, which is a really unique venue. It's one of the oldest restaurants in San Francisco, and uh, Miles picked it up. And uh, you know, good on you, Miles, to get that uh, classic uh, venue for the SF New Tech party, which which I'm really happy about because. Uh, I think uh, it, it'll make it kind of special that night. So it's a festive fundraiser, 1218 at the Mays Oyster House, San Francisco. Yeah. And uh, we want to see you there. You know, the Miles donates a very big portion uh, to anyone who needs it. It's probably going to go to the Philippines, probably this next one. Will she be there, yeah. Greg? Uh, Will she? she be there? Well, it's, uh, the woman in this picture right here. Oh, that's a he. Oh, that's a he. Okay. Just kidding. Just kidding. I, don't <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I don't know. Hey, I don't know. <laughs> whatever floats your boat, buddy. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> I don't judge. I don't judge you. Just be you, Greg. Be you, baby. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, yeah. So, uh, and then, um, so we want to see you out there next week if you can, uh, tomorrow and uh, 12 18. And what's, what's this old FC conference that uh, you put up there? Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see if I can get fancy with mine too yeah, here. Fancy. But yeah, uh, yeah. I think. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, man. The OFC 2014. Technical this network. is ah. the yeah very nerdy technical conference. Uh, this one's March 9 through 13. So we're giving you an early warning here, people. Uh, at Moscone Center in San Francisco. Uh, very That's early. March 9 through 13th. It's a tech conference. Uh, the future of optical networking. Uh, communication, as you can see, there's a ton of information. There's going to be over 550 exhibitors, um, all kinds of topics from cloud bandwidth, uh, you know, the optical networking, and all this stuff down here. If you're interested in that kind of thing, it should be pretty deep and pretty cool. Uh, again, OFC 2014, we're a proud media sponsor to uh, partner with these guys to uh, help promote the uh, the event, and I'm sure it's going to be totally nice. cool. It's several right. days in Moscone Sever, so so anyone can take over Moscone for that many days. They have they must have a lot to offer too. Wow, that's really cool. That's really cool. And yeah, I saw that on our inbox, so that was kind of neat that yeah. uh, that kind of worked out for us. So that was good. Uh, wow, you got a lot done, man. <laughs> Thanks for the show. I get Appreciate it done. It.
You yeah. So uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, see, how do we get? And you? thank you everyone for for watching this craziness, and make sure to check us out on YouTube. Uh, do a search for Nerd Stalker TV, Nerd Stalker TV, and go to iTunes and. Give us a give us a five star ratings if you could, and if you're watching this at any point on YouTube, part one, part two, uh, there should be either down there or up here in the, uh, depending on where you're watching it, embedded or on YouTube. Give it a thumbs up, thumbs up, please, uh, and, please, uh, please. Share it with all your buddies so that we can uh, we continue doing this and have a good time and let people know uh, about the uh, Nerd Stalker show. Please, and, uh, we'll be very uh, very thankful. Yes, yes, we we when we hope to bring you even better content next year in 2014. So. Yes, sir. So anyway, uh, how do we get a hold of you, uh, Adolfo Ferranda? Please feel free to email me, Adolfo at nerdstalker.com or uh, at a Ferranda on Twitter. You can reach both me and Greg at nerdstalker uh, at nerdstalker on Twitter. Yes. And yes. Greg, what about you? You can catch me on Twitter at socialgreg, uh, or you can uh, email me at socialgreg at nerdstalker.com. And uh, like Adolfo said, we also look at the Nerdstalker Twitter uh, handle every day, every minute, every moment, especially yes, if they're talking about Adolfo Ferranda. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, and thanks. They usually do, let's admit it. Come on. Oh, they usually do. I mean, He's like a prettier, look at this. Look at this. I know. I know. With that, I know. Huh? You're a tough guy. You're a tough guy. You know, I wouldn't mess with you in the dark, in a dark alley. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't mess with you in the dark. Warm back of the hand here. Warm back of the hand, Greg. (laughs) All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening again to another Nerd Stalker. Yes, thanks for watching Nerd Stalker. We believe in tech, startups, design, and you. Be careful out there. See you.